Welcome to the ministry of God's word for this evening. May the Lord's great name be praised. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And it is my prayer that hearing from the scriptures will help sustain you and refresh you in these difficult days. Let us pray. Our most holy God and Father, we thank you for revealing your glory in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is preeminent in all things, the name above all other names. We thank you, Lord, for the fullness of grace, grace upon grace that is found in him. O oh Lord, in your mercy, may we all be partakers of Christ. And we ask, Lord, as we hear the scriptures this evening, that you would touch our hearts, that you would open up the eyes of our understanding, that we would see the Lord Jesus, know him and love him and worship him, and that you would give us grace to hear his voice speaking to us, to the praise of your glory. Amen. I'd like us to turn first to the prophet Daniel and to Daniel chapter 7 and beginning to read from verse 15 in which the prophet Daniel describes one of the, the visions of the kingdom of God that he was given at a time when the people of God were in great difficulty, um, in, in, in exile, facing ruin, um, but he's given this wonderful vision of our Lord Jesus Christ. So reading from Daniel in chapter 7, and from verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broke in pieces and trampled the residue with its feet and the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows i was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favour of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings, who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall rise after them he shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings he shall speak pompous words against the most high shall persecute the saints of the most high and shall intend to change times and law then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time but the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the most high. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. 
As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. And let us turn to the Gospel according to Mark as we continue our study in the Gospel. And reading from Mark in chapter 12, sorry, chapter 13, and beginning to read from verse 14. Mark chapter 13 from verse 14. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. For in those days there will be tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Then, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or look, he is there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. Amen. In the year AD 66, Jewish nationalists, fighting bravely, succeeded in driving out Roman forces, driving them out of Jerusalem, out of much of the Promised Land. That The Romans had occupied them for for over 130 years. But that long desired national liberation did not lead to peace and prosperity. Rival factions amongst the Jewish fighters turned on one another. One group seized control of the temple and they desecrated it. Their leader falsely claiming to be Christ and to be high priest and even murdered some of his fellow Jews, his enemies, in the temple. It was an abomination within its holy walls. It was chaos. It was anarchy. And so then it didn't take the long for the Romans to strike back. And their campaign to, to retake the land in Jerusalem came to a climax in AD 70 with what's known as the Siege of Jerusalem. The Romans built a wall around the city, trapping the inhabitants inside so they would starve. The Jewish historian Josephus records parents eating the bodies of their dead children in desperation. It was, it was horrific. It's also said that the Romans ran out of trees because they crucified so many around Jerusalem, hundreds every week until finally they breached the walls and fire consumed the city and the temple itself was destroyed. 
as the Lord Jesus surely spoke about this in our passage. In those days, there will be tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning of creation. But here in Mark, as the scriptures record, the Lord Jesus gave this, this remarkable prophecy, warning the disciples what was coming, speaking some 40 years before it would take place. Lord Jesus, in the power of the Spirit, was warning them what would happen to, to Jerusalem and, and the temple so that the church could escape. The Lord was acting to protect his people, the good shepherd through his word, guarding his flock. And that is the, the central theme I want to draw out for you from this scripture. The good shepherd protecting his people, warning them of, of different dangers. Now, now, how to understand this scripture? Well, as we've seen, the Lord Jesus was beginning to speak to the disciples about the end. The, the end of the world, the, the coming of the kingdom of God. And they asked for a sign. When will these things be? He warns them the temple will be destroyed. That, if you like, is the sign. That is the mark of the beginning of the end. The, the temple's destruction marks the, if you like, the, the, the beginning of a final cataclysmic age. An, an era that will be marked by war and, and confusion, suffering by, by false religion. But he also teaches them that the end would not come straight away. The fall of the temple would be the, the beginning of sorrows, he says. Mark the beginning of a final age of the world in which the gospel would go out around the world, a time of great grace and of, of mercy for many to, to be brought into the kingdom. And then would come the end, the, the coming of the kingdom and the new creation, the, the, the new world. But until that day comes, that final dawn, uh, the world will know troubles. And from verses 14 to 20, the, the Lord seems to speak about this, this fall of the temple as a sign. Specifically, as, but in a way to safeguard the church in Jerusalem. Now it is possible that there is a, a layer to the meanings here, as, as many over the years have interpreted it, and seen that perhaps this is not just about the fall of the temple in Jerusalem, but in some sense foreshadows other events that will happen right at the very end, perhaps concerning the Antichrist and a coming persecution of the church, and a great tribulation still to come, and and that does indeed also seem to be the case. But for those first disciples here, there was also this very practical warning here. He, he tells them to, to, to watch out for the abomination of desolation, as spoken about by the prophet Daniel. A passage that is part of those visions that you heard from Daniel. Daniel speaking about 500 plus years previously. And at his point, the Lord gave Daniel a vision of the coming empires and kingdoms in the next few centuries and how they would even persecute uh, the saints of God. And in particular, he prophesied about the dangers posed by a man called Antiochus Epiphanes, a despot who would conquer the Jews, try to destroy them, and how he would desecrate the temple, even offering the blood of Jews and setting up pagan idols in it setting up a false high priest and, and saying, you know, that, that was a real abomination of desolation in the most holy of places. And so here the Lord seems to be saying that as a warning to the church, when you see those same things happening in the temple, as in the, the zealots and the rebellions and how they, they damage the temple, he's saying that's the great warning sign, to flee. And indeed, there's, there's evidence that the early church in those in those years of AD 66 and onward, they, they did indeed flee and many of them were, were spurred and were rescued out of the disaster that happened. They would need to hurry. They'd go through great hardship. There'd be real dangers. But the Lord was protecting his people, protecting his church and then, and then also giving them this comfort, saying that the Lord would use his almighty power to, to protect them, that the Lord would shorten the days for the sake of his elect. That the sovereign Lord from his throne in heaven would 
would overrule the cruelty of the Romans, bring the war to an end, lest it be too great for his church. And again, I think rightly, as we look at the book of Revelation, there's a, a foreshadowing here. There's a pattern that perhaps there'll be something similar at the very end before the coming of Christ. A great time of tribulation and persecution of the church. But that again, the Lord will cut it short for the sake of his people. But the point I, I really want to help you to see here, and, and the real thing that the Lord's purpose in saying these things to the disciples, is it's really quite staggering here. How it shows us how much the Lord loves his church, his elect. The sovereign Lord so loves his elect, he will overrule, he will ordain and control world events and cut them short for what is best for his church. We're giving an insight here into the Lord's purposes for history. How he overrules nations and empires and wars and, and directs all things for the good of his church, for the sake of his elect. Again, the Lord is, is teaching the disciples and he's teaching us, his church, how to understand the world and the time that we live in and, and this, this age that we're in. His purpose in all of it is the good of his church. All things working together for the good of his people. There's a great encouragement there that we should be taking hold of. The Lord protects his people from real earthly dangers. Watching over his church in Jerusalem. He's still today watching over his flock. Now although we must never test the Lord. We must never presume. But there is a real promise we can rely on. It doesn't mean that we won't suffer or, or face real dangers. But it is true. That the Lord is almighty and protects his people. He might lead us through the fire, but, but in his perfect wisdom, there are times when he, he intervenes and changes world events for the good of his people. He answers prayer. He, he raises his people up from sickness sometimes. He, he sends providential helps and escapes, sometimes dramatically so. I think probably there's, we all had that, that shiver up our spine the first time we, we heard the story of John G. Patton in the, the, the Outer Hebrides. And, and when the tribe came to kill him, they turned back in fear because they saw the angels standing guard. The Lord does sometimes intervene and save his people. He protects us. And as here, he, he guards us through the scriptures. As we listen to his teaching and, and keep his commandments... We will avoid much suffering. We'll avoid many dangers in this life. The life spent following Christ is a blessed life. Again, it doesn't mean we won't suffer. We, of course we will, although there won't be dangers of persecution. But sticking closely to his word, we, we are often preserved. And so there's a great comforting thought here. As he's explaining these great events to the disciples, you know, how, how their minds must have been, been shaking However, they must have trembled to think that there would be these, these terrible dangers ahead, times of difficulty. And, but he says to them, but the sovereign Lord is in charge. He can even cut it short for the sake of his elect. So everything that we're going through now is part of this age. COVID, lockdowns, maybe persecutions. The sovereign Lord is in control. And he will work it all for the good of his church. He will preserve and protect his church. That's the comfort he's giving the disciples and us here. And then, not just practical dangers from wars and things like that. If you look at verses 21 to 23, he protects us from false teachers. He warns the disciples. He warns us. Part of this last age is that there will be many false teachers, false Christs, imposters, false religions, false saviors. Even some, he says, performing signs and wonders to try and fool the elect. Wolves in sheep's clothing. And so again, he's protecting us. He's saying, how, how can we avoid being deceived or led astray? He says, take heed. Take heed. I have told you all things beforehand. Forewarned is forearmed. 
Again, he's saying this is the age we live in. This is one of the dangers. Take heed. Watch, Christian. Discern. Test. Be aware. Think. Study. Have your guard up. In the words of 1 John, test all things. Sometimes as Christians, we're just so naive and we, we swallow whatever the latest fad is. Whatever the latest trendy preacher brings or the newest book. We were swept up with the world's way of thinking and its excitements and currents. And, and we don't stop to test everything by the scriptures. The Lord says, I have told you, I forewarned you. We must be looking to his word, his voice as the guide and the rule. As Isaiah says to the law and the testimony, if they do not speak according to this, they have no light. The Lord's saying, here's how you protect yourself from these spiritual dangers. A far greater danger than even war or disaster like the, the first one. A far greater danger would be to, to deceive and led astray from Christ. That even if the elect might be harmed, they would be saved in the end, but, but harmed along the way. And we would miss out on much. He's saying, have your guard up. Listen to his word. Listen to him. Don't be like an infant who puts everything to their mouth. Eat only what is good. The way to escape false teaching is to, to listen to him and to do the hard work of meditation and of, and of prayer, studying the scriptures till they're, they're our very blood, uh, they're in us. You remember the words of Psalm 1? The righteous man who bears his fruit in season, he, he stands firm like a, like a tree by the water side. And why? Because the law of the Lord is his delight. Day and night he meditates upon it not so the wicked they are like chaff they're like the dust that's blown away by the wind they're unstable they they cannot stand before god because they don't know the truth and they're not grounded in it what the lord is saying here is the same warning we're given in ephesians 4 we must not be children tossed to and fro like a, a ship on the waves tossed back and forth by every wind and wave of, of teaching Instead, we must grow up and mature into him who is the head, Christ, nourished in the good words of the faith, knowing the truth in love. So the Lord was warning the disciples and, and the temple is a sign of it. This age is characterized by these, these dangers and wars and destruction and by deceit and, and false teaching. The devil is a liar. And the way is hard and the path is narrow. There are few who find it but his word prepares us guards us keeps us against these dangers brothers and sisters love the scriptures search the scriptures perhaps also this passage it, it speaks to us more generally about that that flaw in human nature which which leads us to put our trust in false hopes we seem drawn to this, don't we? False hopes. In a sense, very literally, you know, the Lord describes here some saying, look, the Christ is over here or he's over there. But again, we're having to wait. It's a time of waiting. But it's that tendency in us to put our hope in some things that seem simple and easy. To put our hope sometimes in anything and everything but the Lord. We want it now. We some often put our hope in politics, whether a philosophy or a person. Oh, if, you know, just if such and such a person's elected, oh, then, then the problems will be solved and the world will be better. But the scripture says, do not put your trust in princes. But, but do it, we just get caught and swept up in that, don't we? As the Lord's describing of, oh, come, come and hear this, come and see this. We put our hope in the midst of these troubles, we put our hope in science and knowledge and, and human achievement. And God in grace gives us many such gifts. Vaccines and things are, are his gifts to help us. But there's always another illness. There's always another disease. And death comes for us all. Science is not going to fix and save the world. Even though that is the great hope of 21st century unbelieving man. It cannot deal with sin. It cannot heal the human spirit. 
can't make us right with God. It can't answer the deepest questions. It can't save us from death. But whatever it is, the Lord's warning us here about these false saviours, false hopes. Don't be swept up in it. Don't be fooled, says the Lord. There's one true hope. There's one true hope the church must live by. Again, he's, he's setting the course. He's setting the direction here for, for the disciples and for us to follow. He says, here's the real hope you should be looking for. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why the Lord then goes on to, to give them the true hope. How all the tribulations of the world are, are really going to come to an end. He says, you should be looking for this. The fall of the temple marks the beginning of the end. The end itself comes with his glorious return. You will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. He's saying, here's how to live in this evil age of all these dangers, all these deceptions. You fix your hope on this. This is what you're living for. This is what you're trusting in. The real answer for the world. He's coming. He's coming, brothers and sisters. In those days after that tribulation, the age of tribulation as it comes to an end, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. This is the language of prophets, prophetic language. The Lord using it out of the Old Testament, the, the vocabulary, the language that they were given to describe the, the end of creation, a reversal of creation, the end of the world and its order and its time as we know it. An apocalyptic ending of this, this evil age, a cataclysm in which it's all reordered. But symbolically, the, the stars, the heavenly things, they, they represent the evil forces of darkness, the devil and his spirits, the powers of sin and death, the, the powers of man that currently enslave the world. They will be cast down. They will come to an end. This whole corrupt system we're living in and the Son of Man will come in the clouds with great power and glory. Again, the Lord is telling us this is the fulfillment of, it was another vision given to Daniel. That when the saints of God are crying out, they're being oppressed and, and this is the great hope. They're told to look and see that the Son of Man is coming. Riding on the clouds. That's a, that's a way of picturing his divine power his authority over all creation. The Lord Jesus, risen, ascended, exalted in heaven, given all authority and power. His glory as God revealed, it was hidden in the flesh. He came as a servant to give himself. Now revealed in his glory. And he's saying, in the times of great distress, you trust in this, this is the hope. There'll be a day, there's a day coming, like no other. It is marked on God's calendar, known only to him. But this has always been our great hope. The coming of the Savior in power and judgment. Jude tells us that even Enoch, seventh from Adam, so even from the very beginning, the very beginning of the human history, that was the hope that he prophesied. The Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly. He's not going to be like the cavalry suddenly appearing with the dawn on the top of the hill, his people down in the valleys of darkness, distress, darkness, false teachers. He's going to appear and come to the rescue. Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians, the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven, revealed like the curtain between that part of, of creation and us will be, will be peeled open suddenly that the heavens will split and he'll come with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God. When he comes in that day, that day appointed, the one day to be glorified in his saints. 
John in the Revelation, he says, this is the hope. When you're oppressed, when you're discouraged, when it's going against you, when you're, you're fleeing. I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. That's the steed of a victorious conqueror. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And on his thigh is written his name, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, brothers and sisters, in dangers, through false teaching, this is the glorious hope. This should be our inspiration and encouragement. This is what we're looking for. The literal, physical, bodily return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in weakness, but in glory. He's coming. Shouldn't we think much more of this? Shouldn't we, brothers and sisters, be thinking of this much more? But don't we just sometimes seem to, to forget these glorious things? That this is how it's all going to end? We, we get discouraged. Sometimes the world just picks us up. We get carried away in day-to-day -day busyness. Just enmeshed, trapped like in a spider's web with all the different demands and responsibilities upon us. And we, we forget this glorious end that's coming. Christian, lift up your head. You should be expecting this with joy, looking forward to it. The scriptures warn us that the world finds this belief laughable. As it says in 2 Peter, scoffers will come in the last days, the last days, this age, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things in creation continue as they are. But then it says, we know his coming will be like a thief in the night. So exactly when the world does not expect it, when the world no longer believes in it, then we should expect it. He's coming. And look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So I have to challenge you, brothers and sisters. Do you believe these things? Do you believe this when the world hears this and it laughs at this? Do you believe this? Is it your hope? Are you living for it? This glorious day that is coming. We all need hope. We need hope to live. You know, they say a man can live three minutes without oxygen, three days without water, three weeks maybe without food. You can't live three seconds without hope. And so many people today in the 21st century, that they have an angst and a despair. They're looking at the world and say, where is this going to end? What a glorious message we've got. We know exactly how it's going to end. There's dangers all around. There's deception all around. But what a hope. There's deliverance coming. The Savior's coming. It's a hope. It's a hope big enough. Big enough for the world. And this is the word to the Lord's people. The end has begun. The end has begun. It's coming. Wait for it. Look for it. The last trumpet will sound. There will come a day. Marked on God's timetable. There will come a day when the sun will rise on this world for the last time. There will come a day when the last cry of pain ever will be heard. There will come a day when the last act of sinful violence will ever be committed. And they will end. It will be gone. Done. A day when, for the last time, a Christian is persecuted. There's going to be a day when there will be the last ever human death. There's going to be a time, a day when there will be the last ever tear of sorrow. And the last sin will ever be committed. And it will end. And then this glorious new day begins. When he suddenly appears. So hear this word from the Lord to comfort you. 
and encourage you. Like at the fall of the temple, we, we're, we're living in this age that, that's pictured in it, an age full of destruction, disaster, danger, and false teaching and deceit. But you set your eyes on this hope, this glorious hope. He's coming. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word that is so full of wisdom and power. That truly, Lord, you know all things and that you have even revealed them to us. Lord, we thank you for protecting us. And we pray that we as a people would cling closely to your scriptures, love them and study them and keep them. And we thank you, Lord, that they warn us about the dangers we face. And Lord, we thank you that we know how this world will end. We know where everything is leading to that day of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that, that all who hear this would feel their hearts stirred and lifted up by this glorious hope. And for any who hear this, Lord, outside of Christ who, who do not know him, who are looking for hope, we pray, Lord, that you would open their eyes to, to see him. Lord, we thank you that we live, we die in this hope. In Jesus' name, amen.